each of the speakers will speak for five minutes and then we'll do Q&A. Um, Dr. Gordon Edwards of the Canadian Coalition for Nuclear Responsibility, followed by Janet McNeil of Durham <coughs> Nuclear Awareness, and Christine Alwell of the Sierra Club of Canada National Foundation. Foundation. Yeah. So, please, I'll, I'll be Thank doing you. the time. Greetings, everybody. I'm very happy to, to um, be here to present a very important issue of public interest in Canada, in Ontario, and uh, in fact in North America. I have written a letter to President Obama and Prime Minister Trudeau, which has been endorsed by 26 organizations on both sides of the border, asking these uh, heads of government to delay or cancel the shipment of um, 23,000 liters of very highly radioactive liquid waste over public roads and bridges um, to, from the Chalk River facility in Ontario to the Savannah River site in South Carolina. The, uh, these shipments would take place in 100 to 150 convoys over a period of about four years. And we are talking about material which one liter of which would be sufficient to ruin an entire city's water supply. We know this from testimony in the U.S. Congress. Imagine 23,000 liters. Each shipment would contain about 64 of these liters. One shipment is more than enough to contaminate an enormous quantity of water. Now, our second letter, which is in the press kit, is a letter to the joint co-chairs of the Great Lakes Executive Committee which under the 2012 uh, Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement uh, are required to be notified and they in turn are required to notify um, First Nations, Métis, provincial governments, local governments, first responders and the public as to what are these shipments and what the risks might be to the Great Lakes. Uh, this will be spoken about in more length by uh, Christine U. Elwell who will be attending the meetings happening later this week in Toronto on the Great Lakes, including the International Joint Commission. Now, um, we also are asking uh, for both governments to prepare an environmental impact statement, which astonishingly has not been done. An environmental impact statement guarantees that all of the, not only all of the environmental risks and health risks are looked at and uh, analyzed, but also the alternatives are looked at. Because when you look at the alternatives, you discover that these shipments are completely unnecessary. There are alternatives which are already in place, already being used, which would make these shipments unnecessary and achieve all the objectives of the, and save a lot of money, by the way. Uh, the Canadian government is prepared to spend $60 million of taxpayers' money for these unnecessary shipments. That works out to be about $2,600 per liter. Anybody want to pay $2,600 per liter for this <laughs> nuclear waste material? Um, the alternatives that I mentioned include solidification. There are, in fact, 21 tanks of liquid waste at Chalk River, nuclear waste, which 20 of those tanks, the contents are already being solidified. Moreover, the one tank, which is the one that they propose to send south, is, um, has been closed since 2003. And for the last 13 years, they have been solidifying the material that would have gone into that tank. So they know how to solidify this stuff. They're already doing it on a large scale. And in fact, when the license of Chalk River was renewed in 2011, they said that's what they would do with this material. There's another point, however, and that is what's so special about this tank? The special thing is that it contains weapons-grade uranium, which isn't true of the other tanks. And President Obama has launched an initiative to get this weapons-grade material out of other countries so that it can't be used for atomic bombs. We are in favor of that, but we don't think it has to be done by transporting it to Savannah River. It can be down-blended on-site, and that will eliminate the weapons-grade uranium by converting it into low-enriched uranium, not weapons-usable. That's already been done this year in a matter of three months in Indonesia by the same type of material. So we know it can be done, and in fact, in 2011, the Department of Natural Resources here in Canada wrote a report and said that's what they were going to do 
with this fish tank. So we're hoping that uh, the president and the prime minister will sit up and take notice that their responsibility is being overlooked. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Janet McNeil, coordinator of Durham Nuclear Awareness, DNA for short. The DNA group was formed after the Chernobyl accident in 1986. Currently, our primary focus is on nuclear emergency planning issues. I've been DNA's coordinator since 2012, but I've been attending CNSC, Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission hearings, for 10 years now, having become intrigued by a particular issue when I lived up in Deep River. As became clear to me immediately, there are very serious concerns with the way the CNSC operates, issues around independence, transparency, secrecy, and especially trust. As the recent whistleblower incident involving CNSC staff clearly illustrates, decisions made by the CNSC tribunal members are very often not fully informed decisions. Anonymous CNSC staffers have made it clear that the industry cannot be counted upon to provide full information to the tribunal members who make the decisions. These whistleblower revelations put very much into question the claim that the CNSC is really about safety at all. One need definitely not be a rocket scientist or even a scientist to learn to read between the lines of nuclear industry and CNSC jargon. Dr. Edwards is a bit like a rocket scientist. He has a thorough grasp of the technically complex details of this proposal. Nuclear matters are complicated and the true extreme risks involved. But there's plenty here for the average citizen who is not technically minded that stands out in sharp relief. Number one, right off the top, there's no actual need for this project with its very considerable risks, as Dr. Edwards has just explained. Number two, the casks that have been approved on both sides of the border for use in this project have not been tested for use involving liquid waste. Extremely toxic liquid high-level waste in a cask designed for solid, should it meet with an unfortunate accident of some kind, will clearly not behave in the same fashion as solids would. It will spill, causing irreparable harm to human beings and the environment. Number three, there have been recent incidents at the Chalk River facility, variously referred to as either CNL or CRL, one in late October last year, one in April of this year, involving the dropping of used solid fuel. In the case of the incident last October, which involved the same cask and fuel caddy assembly attended for use in these projected 100 plus shipments, Canada's nuclear regulator was not notified promptly. CNSC staff were, CNSC staff were not notified until four weeks later, even though CNSC has staff permanently on site. There was then a very significant delay in notifying CNSC's tribunal members, the ones responsible for making the big decisions. It was just under three months until they were notified. They were not impressed. The transcript of their January 28th meeting at which this matter was discussed involves tribunal members using the words deception and serious weakness in CNL's management system and safety culture. More details could be shared. Improper welds, unqualified welders, faulty quality assurance at the manufacturing end. One of the same caddies being used 12 hours later in a shipment to the Savannah River site. A virtual cascade of human error, lack of transparency, lack of appropriate reporting and notifications, and all of this stretching over a three month period. These two incidents raise major red flags regarding the re reliability of operators, manufacturers, machinery, quality control staff, CNSC regulatory staff, and the nuclear industry's ability and inclination to disclose to disclose appropriately, communicate promptly and fully about serious issues involving safety among industry stra staff to the regulator and between CNSC staff and the commissioners or tribunal members. Which is a good segue to number four, the reality that transportation accidents and incidents involving nuclear shipments do occur, although CNSC boasts about industry's excellent record. In January of this year, there was a yellow cake spill in Saskatchewan that shut down the highway for 30 hours. Back in August 2013, a shipment of uranium hexafluoride from Cameco was involved in a truck fire in Ohio. Neither Canadian nuclear authorities nor those in the U.S. were notified because apparently there was no requirement that they be notified. Leading nicely to point number five, that awareness of the very high risks surrounding the transportation of nuclear wastes led a U.S. mayor's group to pass a resolution in 2014 <coughs> 
calling for the safe quotes for the safe treatment and storage of radioactive waste on site where appropriate to mitigate health and environmental risks of transporting low, high, and mixed level waste to off site treatment facilities. Number six, given a clear awareness of how damaging a spill of these materials would be to the farmlands in Ontario's fruit growing region, the regional government in Niagara passed a resolution in June 2014 opposing the proposed shipments. And remember, this is not just once, but potentially 150 times. I'll read it out. That regional council expresses opposition in principle to any shipment of radioactive liquid waste over public roads and bridge or on any navigable waterways or by air, recognizing that such waste can be, has been, and should be solidified so that it is far less accessible to the environment and living things, and that regional council ur urge the governments of Canada and the United States to halt the shipment of high-level radioactive liquid waste from Chalk River Laboratories to the Savannah River, pending the outcome of full public consultations on the advisability and the potential adverse impacts of the proposed shipments, as well as the alternative procedures to achieve the stated objectives for such shipments. More could be said about issues at the Chalk River facility, about transportation risks and accidents, about nuclear decisions not involving proper oversight, and I haven't even touched on the depth of the opposition to this plan in the U.S. Let me conclude by pointing to a similarity to the Bruce Power Plan several years ago to ship radioactive steam generators through the Great Lakes, St. Lawrence Seaway and Atlantic Ocean to Sweden, another highly risky, risky utterly unnecessary scheme. In speaking to federal politicians about this plan, I was able to point out that this was not a case where simplistic labels of anti-nuclear or pro-nuclear had any relevance. At issue was the extreme riskiness of the proposal, which was very clearly apparent to people on both sides of the nuclear divide. Also at issue was a shocking lack of transparency and glaring lack of appropriate public consultation. The same thing we are dealing with here now with these proposed shipments involving a plan that is unprecedented and which has not been subject to review by the public or other government departments. Like the proposed shipment of radioactive steam generators was, this project must be stopped. It's not sensible, it's not smart, it's not safe, it's not responsible, it's not necessary, and it does not require rocket science, merely common sense to see this. The public agencies we rely on must do as the Regional Municipality of Ni Niagara Region has done. Take the time to examine all the relevant facts very carefully. Put the plan under a fine tooth comb that includes investigating alternatives in an open process involving the public so that we can trust that the risks involved are being fully examined and properly investigated before any decision is reached. Problems at Chalk River should be seen as a warning signal that repatriating liquid HEU, which involves new and unproven technology, is risky and war warrants a full environmental assessment. <coughs> Good morning. My name is Christine Alwell. I'm the Green Energy Campaigner for Sierra Club Canada Foundation. As you know, the uh, Great Lakes governments, the International Joint Commission, and the Great Lakes Commission are meeting here in Toronto this week under great fanfare. The theme of the International Joint Commission's Great Lakes Public Forum, which is Wednesday, October 5th, is to provide public input into evaluating how the governments have achieved progress in accomplishing the goals and the objectives of the 2012 Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. Our assessment of the progress of that agreement is disappointing as reflected in the example of this proposed highly radioactive liquid nuclear waste and the failure to apply the obligations contained in the 2012 agreement. On Wednesday, we will read into the record the letter we have written to uh, Prime Minister Trudeau and President Obama and seek assurances that the uh, governments and the International Joint Commission will adhere to the uh, agreement, in particular Articles 2 and 6. In your press kit, you should have excerpts from that 2012 agreement. Uh, you will see that there is a requirement to provide notice and a response and, uh, and particularly to do um, an assessment of threats to the Great Lakes. 
The theme of the 2012 revisions to the 1972 Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement was to anticipate, prevent, and respond to threats of the waters of the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence River system. See, for example, the excerpts provided on the purpose of the 2012 agreement, Article 2.1c and Article 2.3. From that article, you see that the purpose of the agreement was to restore and maintain the integrity of the waters, to, quote, eliminate or reduce to the maximum extent possible environmental threats to the waters of the Great Lakes. And most importantly, and this is the main theme of that agreement in paragraph 2.3, to anticipate and prevent environmental problems by implementing measures that are sufficiently protective to achieve the purpose of the agreement. To further the goal to anticipate, prevent, and uh, respond to threats, the parties set out notice and response obligations in Article 6 of the 2012 agreement. And that's also in your package. Article 6, notification and response. The parties acknowledge the importance of anticipating, preventing, and responding to threats to the waters of the Great Lakes. The parties commit to the following notification and response process. Sub A and B are dealing with where there actually is a pollution incident. Paragraph C, however, is, quote, the parties shall notify each other through the Great Lakes Executive Committee of planned activities that could lead to a pollution incident or that could have significant cumulative effects and impacts on the waters of the Great Lakes. And then there's a list of some 10 different uh, activities. And guess which is number one? Number one is the storage and transfer of nuclear waste or radioactive materials. This unprecedented transportation of highly radioactive liquid waste is clearly within the scope of the notice obligations the parties set out for themselves in Article 6. So what is this Great Lakes Executive Committee and who is responsible to act? We've also provided to you a copy of the mandate of the Great Lakes Executive Committee. The 2012 Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement set out the terms of reference for this committee. It's basically made up of the two government's officials. The mandate is set out as follows in your package. Meetings of the Great Lakes Executive Committee shall serve as a discussion for for the purpose of providing advice to the parties via the two co-chairs, one from each party. The parties may also consider advice from other parties. The role of the executive committee is to coordinate, implement, review, and report on programs, practices, and measures undertaken to achieve the Great Lakes water quality objectives. It's to provide a form for the parties to notify each other of planned activities that could lead to a pollution incident or that could have significant cumulative impacts. This harkens back to the obligation in Article 2. So there's a specific duty on the Executive Committee to review these proposals. And not only that, it's to provide a form for other entities, and it lists them, federal agencies, state and provincial governments, municipal governments, tribal First Nation, Métis, water management agencies, local agencies, as well as non-members, that is the public. So there's a specific duty on this executive committee to do the review necessary of planned activities, specifically the transport of nuclear waste, to be able to advise the government parties on the implications for cumulative impacts and adverse effects on the Great Lakes. So without a detailed and accurate notice, the Great Lakes Executive Committee cannot respond by providing meaningful advice to the governments, including the perspective of others, such as municipalities and the public. To be clear, proper notification through the Executive Committee would only be meaningful if subject to a public environmental assessment and environmental impact statement that includes alternatives to this extremely risky proposal. And only then can you consider what uh, um, 
impacts could be avoided, as promised in the 2012 Great Lakes Quality Agreement. We asked the two governments' co-chairs to cancel or delay the planned shipments until, one, a public impact assessment has been prepared in both countries that considers alternatives and provides public input, and that proper notice be given of the radioactive content of this soup of nuclear waste materials and um, to uh, avoid uh, potential impacts to the Great Lakes, the source of 20 percent of the world's fresh water and used by 50 million people in the Great Lakes area. So we are giving the Executive Committee 30 days to respond to our requests. There isn't anything specifically mentioned about the Ontario government, but it should be borne in mind that these shipments definitely affect Ontario. They're going to be originating in Ontario at Chalk River. They're going to be going down the Trans-Canada Highway parallel to the Ottawa River, uh, either north or south. If they go south, they're going to go through Ottawa. They're going to be cr traversing uh, large areas of Ontario's uh, um, territory and crossing bridges which are linking Ontario to the United States somewhere. Now, one of the aspects of these shipments is that they are not revealing the precise routes uh, for security reasons, and they seem to be using that as a way of shutting out public discussion. But in fact, there's no reason for that. Even if they were to make the shipments, there's no re that is no excuse not to have an environmental assessment which talks about the potential for accidents along the way. And also, I think the Ontario government should be pushing for the same thing. They should be insisting that their rights be respected, that Ontario citizens are concerned here, that the Niagara Regional Council has unanimously recommended that these shipments be halted, at least pending public review, a meaningful public review. And on top of all that, the, the Ontario government should be insisting on asking the federal government why they're not just handling this problem on site, as has been done everywhere else. I did not mention in my opening remarks, which I had intended to, that nowhere in all of North America has this type of liquid waste ever been transported over public roads. It's a totally unprecedented. Why is that? Because uh, CNSC likes to say, well, we have transported liquid waste, heavy water, for example. There's no comparison. What we're talking about here is the contents of irradiated uranium, the same stuff that was in the Chernobyl meltdown, the same stuff that was in the Fukushima meltdowns. That's the same material but dissolved in acid. So you have a corrosive acid solution and there are dozens of radioactive materials and uranium is actually 17,000 times less radioactive than the other materials in that soup that uh, was so uh, m mentioned by Christine Elwell. So I think that Ontario should be very concerned about this. If the Ontario government wants to live up to its responsibilities, it should be uh, taking action in line with what the Niagara Municipal Council has uh, unanimously recommended. Other questions? There's, there's one other thing I might add, um, and that is that there, as a scientist, I am very offended when uh, an agency which pretends to be science-based, like the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, uses deceptive language to describe a problem. They have described this as highly enriched uranyl nitrate liquid, a completely misleading description and uns unsuitable for anybody who is scientifically qualified. It turns out that uranyl nitrate, which they're talking about in their description of this liquid, is only one compound of dozens in this, in this list. And as I mentioned, it's 17,000 times less radioactive than the other compounds in the same mix. I find this language deceptive and intended to disguise the nature of this waste and the unprecedented nature of it. So the CNSC is, instead of defending the public interest by explaining clearly in scientific terms what we're dealing with, they are trying to gloss it over and keep a low profile and prevent the necessity for adequate environmental assessment. I don't, I don't find that that is uh, honorable behavior. <laughs>